So today's menu is mounts. Uh, I'm super excited uh, about both mounts and Anus, but uh, we should start with uh, mounts. Uh, I'm excited about mounts because uh, the job that he is in is uh, is one that I, I help hire uh, mounts too. Uh, and I've been gone from Linux for a year, and uh, I, with the rapid growth that I experienced in my time there, I'm really curious to, to know what, what happened since and what happened to all the, the good stuff that we, we got going. And uh, I'm not sure, Manus, if you kept totally to, to the initial uh, title, but uh, I know that uh, as a product ops person uh, in, in Linux, you are uh, you have our key player in, in deploying product from top down and from bottom down, from bottom up, uh, and making it come true with with all the product teams. And uh, Anas, uh, Manas is a mentor on the platform, um, and uh, I think uh, instantly when I, when I had a in mentor interview, like the first vetting interview with Anas, uh, we immediately hit it off, and Anas had some really really interesting thoughts on uh, on peer leadership, a new form of leadership. Uh, I felt uh, Linus like suddenly I had 25 reports because uh, I hadn't hired all the managers that, uh, that that should be there and like how do you manage that? So when you're you need to be pragmatic then and and, and look uh, beyond the books again. Uh, and Anas did and uh, came up with an interesting model that he has talked a bit about called peer leadership. Uh, so super excited to to hear uh, what you guys have in store for us today. Um, before we start, uh, I'll just like to do just one one tradition. Uh, ask who's hiring. This is your chance to promote yourself if you are out there hiring uh, product managers or uh, designers or managers or engineering people. Uh, anybody uh, have any jobs available? Anybody looking for somebody? Then uh, nobody's hiring right now. Fair enough. I guess. Uh, it's sometimes it's those times as well. Uh, okay, well then uh, next one is just a quick poll and I'd like you to just uh, enter in the chat. Um, so just before we begin, what is your biggest challenge in regards to many, managing the growth or just you know the, the design of your product organization right now? If we just write that in the chat. Uh, either uh, as a manager where you're actually designing the organization or being part of it living in that organization. So if, if you just take a minute, I'll just be quiet um, and just write your, uh, your, uh, your comments in the chat. And with this one, we won't, uh, we won't continue until there's actually answers. So Anas, getting estimations and commitment from engineering. And especially when you're growing, I guess, then, you know, when your team is changing in size, then uh, the estimations that you had uh, two months ago uh, might not hold true because you changed the entire organization around. So suddenly uh, the team dynamics and everything is, is different. Be, Anna's kind is right, being too busy to make sure that you're not too busy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's actually, it, it comes from one of my, uh, one of my friends who is, uh, organization where he's growing a lot and he's just too busy to find the he's at the point where he needs to get middle management in because there's mm. too many direct and he's just too busy to actually find the right people to make sure that he's not too busy so he feels inequity in his uh, close uh, leadership towards his his uh, his employees or his his team but he just can't find the time because he's so busy taking care of them that he cannot find the time to find somebody to take care of them so that's actually yeah. one of the problems that when is it that you put in that layer, uh, that extra and layer? And suddenly, suddenly you don't have headspace to actually do it, right? Exactly. So that's that's what yeah. I've seen right now. Yeah, yeah I've seen it as well. And Manus, can you uh, mention yours? And Manus, Carlo, you will get a chance also to just state your your, your challenge. Up. Manus, will you tell yours your challenge? Uh, so is transitioning from uh, domain teams, like focusing on very specific domains, to more of a of a, of a journey, uh, journey teams like um, customer journeys instead. I think that's the, the big step for us in the, in the new year, and I'll speak more to, about that in the presentation as well. So client coach kind of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And what about you, Anders? Was I right in, in, in how I commented on your on your challenge, Anders Kralund? Yeah, it's, it's just because we uh, you know we can do discovery and prepare for delivery uh, faster than engineering can actually commit to what the complexity is to deliver stuff. So so we just kind of all the time just reducing scope or increasing scope and, and moving stuff around in, in one big circle, and then means that we we getting uh, like a Q1 and maybe also in this term Q4 uh, roadmap completely committed and actually getting getting to the depth of preparing before starting. That's a, that's a yep. growing concern, but while growing, by the way. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I think it would be really nice for Anas and the Manus who are speaking today just to uh, know what challenges you have. Oh, there is one, Thomas. Take it away. Will you explain it? I don't know. How long time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> but oh, you will get one minute. For, for me, it becomes to to kind of have some some kind of common basic foundation to work, like principles or guides. It doesn't have to be details, but if you don't have those, uh, and and you're always working towards because when I'm attend uh, these kind of sessions, they're usually end up in a situation like okay, everybody starts from scratch with blank white paper and nobody have to consider an already existing landscape and if you're working in a big mm. company old company you have a lot of legacy to consider mm. and how do you manage that uh, like architecture leadership ways of working that you have done for maybe maybe decades and change mm. that to actually be in, in a product setup instead of instead of uh, the old way of doing things because i, I really I re i'm really keen on this uh, I don't know if I should call it because there's a lot of buzzwords. I used one, one myself, mm. mindset, for example. Uh, that's, a, that's a buzzword for me. But in the end, it comes back to that you need to understand and have something to steer you or guide you, or help you. This is the kind of decision we should take. Then we are in line with, with the rest of the uh, landscape, so to say, or rest of the mm. company. <laughs> Sorry, that, yep. that was very short. But it's, it's a huge area for me, which is yep. not. That's why I like your introduction, Anders. When you talked about you need to would like to have these discussions and, and I really kind of was happy and I smiled a lot even if you couldn't see it when I heard that. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, well, I think that's a really good segue to uh, to get started. So, uh, Manus, if you're ready, then uh, steal the screen and take it away. So, uh, I think uh, if you can uh, all just unmute and just give a little bit uh, applause for uh, for Manus. <laughs> Keep on clapping. Yeah. Good Perfect. to have uh, some real, real live clapping here. That is brilliant. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you, everybody. My name is, uh, as Anders mentioned, uh, my name is Magnus. Uh, can you see my slides now? I'm just going to double check before. Yeah, it works fine. So now I'm going over in my own, uh, in my own tab, and I won't see you for a while. But uh, uh, please. Um, Let's save the questions for for later, if any, and we can have a good conversation after the after this uh, small presentation. Yeah, so my name is Magnus. I'm the VP of product. So I'm basically working in uh, an organization where we uh, meet together with the, one of the co-founders, uh, run product and tech. So there's an engineering part that he takes uh, care of, and there's the product and the, the UX uh, uh, people that that I. Uh, manage and uh, we have this kind of peer leadership group although um, Anders will speak more to that in a, in a while um, just a small um, disclaimer perhaps to start with when we speak about these things I think uh, talking about tools and frameworks I think that it is important for me to say a couple of things first of all obviously I speak for myself rather than for the, for the company I will speak about Linus but uh, the views I have on product development and product management and how we run things is is mine. Uh, I also think that when we talk about introducing new tool, tools or working in, in new ways, it's basically down to and very dependent on the relations, the context and the history of that particular organization. So I believe that organizations should be uh, seen uh, primarily as dynamic and process oriented rather than ins instrumental. And so very often we, we, we look at frameworks, we look at models or artifacts or very peculiar ways of doing things. I, I believe we, we must not 
think that they can be implemented in the same way uh, in, in every type of organization across the world. And that seems so logical when I say that, and still that's what we try to do with these best practices and these tools. So obviously we can see it as inspiration, but we need to try it out. We need to take the relationships within the organizations that we're actually doing it, the context we're in, and the history of that particular organization uh, very much in, into consideration when we try to do stuff differently. Uh, and then while we have done that, that meaning and what it means and how it works for us can only be found retrospectively, right? So we have to do it, do something in order to actually then reflect on it and understand, okay, how can this work in our organization and how can we change it and adjust it and so on and so forth. So don't do this at home, what, what I'm about to talk about, but rather perhaps be inspired and then end up doing it in your way. I think that's that's the disclaimer I, I have. But let's jump into it a bit. Uh, so first understand uh, what kind of organization this is. The, the context somehow. Uh, Linus is a partner for growth uh, to the world's best health and fitness coaches, um, global organization. We are very highly rated. So clients using the, uh, the Linus platform rate their coaches and their coach experience very, 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 uh, very high. Uh, we are a company of 420 uh, colleagues, 53 nationalities. We have uh, nine offices in seven different countries. And uh, we we are a young company still. We are five or six years old, right? So we have grown very rapidly. We we like to say that the health coaching and health, the the health coach uh, revolution starts uh, here at Linus uh, because we can really help uh, um, online coaches doing their best work uh, ever. So that's a bit of the context about the the, the organization as such. The product. Uh, the product consists of two sides. There's the technical side, the, the technical platform that enables coaches to manage clients at scale. And then there's the commercial platform, enabling coaches to continuously and sustainably grow uh, their business and their client base. I'm primarily working, obviously, in the technical side of things, but there's a close relationship and a close collaboration between the, 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 the product and the technical side and the commercial side. So the product consists of two parts, basically a client app, an iOS and an Android app where clients use uh, uh, the app to communicate and track progress. And on the other end, a web-based CAM tool, a coach tool, key account management and coach tool, where uh, coaches do meal planning, do workout planning, pipeline management, uh, that sort of thing to actually uh, drive their business forward. So that's the product uh, side of things. That's what we're building. So that's part of the context for us. Um, now that you know a little bit about Linus and, and the product, I think uh, we're ready to speak a little bit about the challenges. So the history of the organization as such, we have a, a very entrepreneurial con uh, culture. As I mentioned, we're pretty young and the growth to 420 people has, has gone very, very quickly. So we have this very strong growth focus, which means that um, all over the organization, people are actively searching for new opportunities. Uh, from a product perspective, we are really interested in having a product leadership globally. So uh, we want to have the superior market position and we're targeting the top five or 10% of coaches uh, globally, right? Uh, and all that success has basically come from a very, uh, very visionary leadership uh, and an entrepreneurial leadership. And I think that context, that history is really important to understand uh, how we worked and how we had to kind of change and adjust the product uh, management and product development to, to fit that kind of culture even better. So if we look at how we organize the teams and the work we are doing uh, in, the, in the past, um, uh, to give you a bit of a context, we had five or uh, six teams, uh, five teams at this point in time, which were very autonomous. So we had a divided ownership in that sense, uh, each team owning their own domain. Uh, we had separate roadmaps, very high degree of, 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 of ownership. Uh, very domain specific metrics so that each domain know uh, what to achieve and so on and so forth. 
uh, and each team had very individual development cadence. So when they felt they had enough evidence to, to build something, they built it. When they felt that they had enough uh, technology in place to deliver it to the market, they did that and so on and so forth. But it was very autonomous uh, still. I think that came with some pros, right? And uh, that was some parts of it that was really really good we we found it very easy to sign responsibilities um there was a lot of freedom for the teams to shape the domain so uh, the pms and the uxers and the tech leads would really own it and really define what a specific domain meant like meals or or workouts but there was also some issues with this right so we felt that there was a lot of silo thinking and there was a lot of not my domain when it came to bugs or issues. We had less focus on the full journey of the coach and the, the client, like the real and actual experience. Uh, and it was also internally harder to communicate uh, who did what to stakeholders who didn't see the product or the product experience from that domain centric perspective that we perhaps did. So we had less ability to change direction as well, because all the teams worked in their own tempo and had different roadmaps as said before. And it wasn't fit, we felt, for a high level business strategy. So what we needed to do was related to better communication. We needed more alignment with the top management. We needed more transparent process so that the rest of the organization understood and had kind of an explicit view of the product development, the product management uh, process. We also had to be able to handle shifting priorities, both having the skills within the team, but also the knowledge to deploy our teams, our people, our resources in different ways. And we had to have a more reliable delivery and an ability to learn quickly and respond to these changes. And then finally, we felt that the holistic experience that I mentioned before was missing. And so collaboration around more joint goals and more joint metrics were, uh, were really important for us as well. So based on that uh, initial analysis, what we did was focus in on two different tools or artifacts or ways of thinking about uh, product uh, development and management. One called missions and one is called cadence, if you like. So let's start with missions. We tried to work with uh, trying to work with missions to address uh, the the problems we had around better communication and the shifting priorities. And I wanted to tell uh, draw your attention or, or mention Stephen Bungay's book, The Art of Action, at this point because I think this is one of the main inspirational. Um, parts that actually helped us understand how to better link strategy with operations or while uh, allowing teams to have a very uh, have a lot of autonomy and and and, and, a, and a way of working with that fitted the uh, fitted uh, uh, our culture well so to speak so if we were to talk about these three areas within product um, the outcomes we want to achieve the plans we do to, to achieve them and the actions we take to achieve those outcomes. There's a, a potential for three different gaps in this picture. The knowledge gap between what we like to know and what we actually know. The gap between alignment uh, or the alignment gap, uh, the difference between what we want people to do and what they actually do when we work. And then the effects gap. The difference between what we expect our actions to achieve and what they actually achieve. And so this is a very natural issue in organization, which has some kind of hierarchy where people know different things at different levels, if you like, and where we have different cadence as a way of working across the organization. And the traditional response is more control, right? It's closing the gap by asking for more detailed information or alignment gap, uh, giving more detailed instructions of how to do things or having more detailed control about the effects of what our action uh, uh, makes, so to speak. And I think both Stephen Bungay uh, as the inspiration, but also our own approach is, has been a bit different. So we like to look at it in a different way. 
we'd like to communicate the intent. What do we try to achieve? Um, we like to talk about how can we align around that, allowing the team to define how they can achieve the intent, right? And articulate the how and the back brief of that, basically. And then allow both the teams, but also individuals in the teams to adjust their actions in line with the intent. So we have a very clear idea of what we'd like to achieve. And then we ask the teams to talk about how we can achieve that, allowing them also to adjust as we move forward. And I think to make indeed this into something which is operational, we use the idea of uh, the artifacts of a mission and a back brief. So we use these artifacts to kind of bridge the gap, if you like. Well, the mission explains what we want to accomplish and why it is, impor uh, why it is important to our organization. Uh, and then we, 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 we ask the teams to suggest these as well. So most of the times these come from the teams. They suggest we should uh, achieve this. We should try to, 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 uh, to make a difference in this area and so on. But they are prioritized by the leadership. And then we have the back brief, which actually describe how we would achieve that particular mission. And those are written by the teams um, that are about to go on those missions and actually do something about it. So th those are written by the people who are about to, to, to work on it. And it, this way, we kind of uh, have some artifacts to mitigate that problem between, between what we try to achieve and how we'd like to achieve it and create kind of a handshake between those two to, to create that a handshake between the strategy basically and the tactics to achieve it so to speak and we see it very much as uh, lightweight tools so these are two pages two slides if you like one with a bet what do we want to do an impact what we try to achieve and why this is important to us and then the back brief which is the solution if this is what we want to do this is then how we could actually achieve this that might highlight some risks, some dependencies. It might be visual. It might be something we try to sketch out to have something which is easier to, to understand for more people and so on and so forth. But it's very lightweight. And then we use these artifacts and they grow in detail as we move in time, so to speak. So we have three different meetings, basically, where we discuss these. It's like a funnel. So in the beginning, there are Though those are more high level, less detailed. And we talk about more of them. We have more missions or potential missions that we discuss. And as we move forward, the next four weeks, we'll have added more information to these. We have done more research. We have talked to more customers. We have had more prototypes of testing. We have looked at more data. And then finally, we basically uh, have these artifacts ready to be prioritized. At this point, we have reduced, we have paused some of the work that we have done because we already see that these missions are not relevant at this point. But we go to the meeting we call bets and ranking and prioritize all the missions. We have more missions at, on the table than we can actually do, obviously. So we'll pick some of them and some of them are then paused for another, another time, if you like. In these meetings, then, we have involvement from top management, so we are able to align on where we are doing, where we are going, and why we are doing what we are doing at all these, uh, at all these different uh, uh, meetings or interfaces and so on, and having some real artifacts to talk about and discuss, which is very much related to what the business wants to achieve, but also look from a product perspective to how we can actually do these things. That's part one. Part two, the other part is the cadence part. So cadence here is how we work, like the tempo we're working in. And we're trying to address having a transparent process, but also having a, a, a reliable delivery, basically. So what we try to do here is inspired by two other things. Shape Up, the book written by uh, people in Basecamp, uh, also of Danish fame, uh, David. Uh, Henneman, uh, Hansen, and the Spotify Rhythm, which is their approach to working agile across the whole, uh, whole organization. And what we try to do here is basically to set down some, uh, some, some, some time-wise rules, if you like. So the cadence in time is fixed, 
but the scope within that time frame is very flexible. So we are focused on shipping valuable increments and learn from the market, making sure that we ship uh, slices of valuable product and get it out so we can actually learn from it. And we do this through scoping, the work that has been prioritized in the meeting I mentioned before, the bets and ranking meeting. Then we allow ourselves six weeks to work on scoping that. That becomes both kind of an, uh, uh, an investigative process where we actually open up the opportunity space, if you like. But it's also about descoping. So the last three weeks might be about descoping, prioritizing within that mission and saying, what is a valuable piece of work that we can actually deliver within the given time we have? And then we go into the development work, which is a five week uh, uh, period of time where the delivery uh, goes into effect. So to speak, probably we have done a lot of the designs already in the latter part of the scoping. We try to focus in on building that slice. We could still de-scope if necessary. We could also add stuff if we feel confident in it. But the idea is after five weeks, we should be ready to quality assure this. So we make sure that we are uh, we have a high quality. Obviously, we do quality assurance during the development as well. And then we are ready to release it into beta and learn from it, so to speak. Uh, we go into something we call hypercare, which is basically just taking a step back, looking at other stuff on the product, taking a breather from the mission before we then pick another mission or the next iteration of the previous one. Um, so that's the way we kind of uh, work with the missions, they are delivered in these cadences and we are managing the scope uh, uh, during during that work process. It helps us from a kind of organizational point of view to have the same cadence, right? So all the teams are starting and stopping at the same time. That makes it easier for us to prioritize what bets we should work on, makes it easier for the teams to actually shift focus. And so we are ready to pick something new up. But it also uh, safeguards the team, so to speak. While we have we are working in our cycles, we are not being disturbed by anything. We're focusing on the missions that we have decided to work on. And we are being very systematic and explicit about it, which makes it much easier for us to communicate to the rest of the organization and tell them when they can give us input or when we could pick something new up and so on. So now we have meetings that they can participate in. We have meetings we're prioritizing. We have periods of time where we focus on actually delivering our stuff, which it makes you know it makes it easier for us uh, to focus and to uh, to prioritize our time so missions and cadence in this uh, sense helps us then uh, populate uh, a roadmap that we can communicate with and communicate through as well it's easier for us to share ideas to identify opportunities and threats uh, both across the different teams we have in the product organization uh, the five or six teams we have, but also to show the rest of the organization what we are prioritize, prioritizing right now and what we are looking into into the future and so on. So it's easier for us to actually have conversation about these things, which in the past were uh, untransparent or unknown for the rest of the organization. So in this sense, we can look at different parts of uh, our product work in different uh, faces, if you like, and have the appropriate conversations and discussions at the appropriate time. But it also helps us to actually make it easier to be explicit about iterations. So when we slice things down and we de-scope and we deliver uh, parts that we know it's a first step, it's valuable, but it's a first step, we can easier talk about we need more iterations on this due to this and this. Uh, usage, uh, these results or these outcomes becomes becomes more visible, if you like. And it's easier for us to manage expectations in that sense uh, as well. It becomes uh, easier to grow the product within the, 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 the consciousness or the understanding of the rest of the organization. It's easier for us to communicate and talk about where we're going next. So that's where we are. We've been working like this in the, the past eight months. 
approximately. So some might say it's still very new, and I agree with that. This is just a beginning, and we're learning uh, uh, about it uh, quite a lot. During this eight months, we have had obviously retrospectives in all the teams, but also had one larger retrospective for the whole product team, which is approximately 65, 70 people. And so based on those learnings, we then adjust, we adjust the process, we add new stuff, we change things and so on and so forth. And I think we've learned so far an, an increased trust from the stakeholders within the organization. Uh, a lot of the different parties within the organization um, have a, a clearer idea of what we are doing and trust us to deliver. They've seen it happen. We have a better focus within the team. It's easier for us to say this part is more important than that part, and that's why we're doing this. And people are have an easier way of understanding and creating meaning out of that. I also believe we, we delivered more value. And when we speak to coaches, they appreciate uh, the work we have been doing and uh, the, 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 the way they can use the product now as opposed to, to earlier. Um, and I also think and see that our ways of working has inspired other parties, other parts of Venus. So now the commercial organization and the scientific organization and others is starting to work similarly in cadences and with an idea of missions and 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 the back brief and so on and so forth. So that's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to see how that can actually become uh, something broader for the organization as a whole. But we also learned that these cadences create deadlines and deadlines can create feelings of stress or an idea of lower quality that we need to be able to deliver something and then we cut corners and so on and so forth uh, if if we're not descoping enough i also think that we have realized that before we prioritize we need to use time to frame and understand what goes into these missions so we need to kind of work with the business outcomes and do uh, research work do tests talk to more customers before already when we when we work with the the, the missions in the back brief even before we prioritize and that's the balance right we don't want to invest too much because we might never do it but we want to invest some in order to decrease the uncertainty and increase the possibilities for us to actually deliver value long term so we need to invest more i think that's one of the learnings that we have uh, that we have um, uh, made us during the last couple of months. We also realized that mid-size work, right? Smaller than missions, but bigger than bugs, if you like. These features, those are difficult to work on and find time for when we are so focused on missions. So there's something there about how do we make sure that we have uh, time and mind space to actually do other stuff uh, which is not the mission, so to speak. And then we might need to align cycles with other parties as well, so that we can work as a whole, right? Uh, as a the whole organization in a way that there's some uncertainty to whether that is the right way of doing it, everyone is in the same rhythm, uh, or if we want to do something else. But I think there's some alignment there that we need to be clear on as well. I think those are also important stuff too uh, to, that we have learned. So where are we going next? Just to uh, end up a little bit uh, with some of the next steps for us. We are, as I mentioned in the chat earlier, focusing on uh, taking the next step towards uh, organizing more around coach and client journeys. So trying to address that holistic experience that we felt we're lacking. We still feel we lack that. And I think that's the next big uh, uh, step. So we're going to continue working with missions and cadence and adjust those. But I think we're going to add even more focus organizationally to work in a coach and a client uh, perspective. And we are doing that in order to have more flexibility regarding the mid-size work that I mentioned before. Also to and make sure that the ownership in the team exceeds the single domain to kind of break with that idea of only having the, 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 the domain as, as, our, um, as our ownership part, if you like, and also mapping that closer to actual usage and how the coach and the client experience the product. And then we want to collaborate even more 
in the in the product organization around the common goals around metrics and missions we might still work and deliver in smaller teams but i think having more conversation in a broader group about what we try to achieve together i think there's a lot of promise there and a lot of power that hasn't been utilized yet in our, our, our team and i'm really looking forward to that so i think those are some of the things we would like to do and then on top of that more practical stuff as i mentioned identifying good practices for that pre-prioritization work working even more with de-scoping to make sure that teams feel confident in what they go into these cadences with and how they deliver that and then align even more with the rest organization and this is kind of a continuous thing right it's not an instrumental thing we can't do that once we have to do it all the time to make sure that we are in line and have a uh, a common pulse, so to speak, within the organization to move forward in a proper way. So that was that. Uh, I think I, I used my time. I hope I used it wisely. And I hope that you have some, uh, some, some thoughts and some feedback and comments to what I just shared with you. I'm going to change this tab so I can see you again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Manus. It was, uh, for me especially, super, super inspiring to see. Uh, I think it's uh, super refreshing to see another take on, on creating a rhythm and pulse for your product organization. That's not that traditional two-week sprint from, uh, from Scrum that, uh, that everybody just implements uh, as a default. Um, I'll just start uh, with one question, but I'll just encourage everybody just to write your questions in the chat uh, and we'll take them from there. But uh, while you're doing that, I'll just I'll just start with a question or two uh, for, for, for Manus. So, um, so Manus, how, how do you then handle and embrace and, and encourage innovation and ideas coming from the teams themselves, you know, bottom up and not only top down? Yeah, I think, I think by talking about it and, and by asking them to do it, and then also, uh, as I mentioned, regarding the pre-prioritization prioritization work to, to make sure that there's time for it, but I must say, uh, not too much time. <laughs> but again, before we had prioritized, we wanted to be a bit lightweight. We wanted to be something we can afford to throw out, right? So, um, so I think there's a value in also doing high-level stuff and doing kind of intuitive stuff and being quick mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, when I look at what kind of mesh missions we have, I would say 85% of them come from the teams. They know hmm. what what's needed, and the way we manage it is oh, manage it. The way we try to frame it is also by speaking about the overall strategic direction we're going in. And I think that's one thing from my point of view to do even more often in the coming year. So having more conversation on what we try to achieve, to kind of seed or create that kind of framework where they can say, okay, that makes sense. Then these ideas or these opportunities that we see when we speak to coaches or clients, th they are more probable to be relevant for us than these other ones. Hmm. Anybody else? I don't write that fast. So I'm trying to write. Then, then, then I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, type in the, another one here. Uh, so, so how do you uh, handle you know this keeping the lights on work uh, that's what i'd like to call it you know work that uh, when you also have missions you know the work that you you can't anticipate but needs to be carried out for the sake of the operations of the company like do you set off time for that or uh, in the scope of a mission or like yeah how does that fit in yeah that's a good question i think some of some of what you're asking there is also what uh, what i what i mentioned that we learned like the mid-sized work Mm -hmm. uh, has been more difficult for us to do uh, or we have been less explicit about it. So I think one way of doing it is is uh, is now uh, when we kind of reorganize to make sure that we have people outside of those teams for a full cadence to not do, you know, bugs, but do mid-sized work, things that doesn't fit into the missions mm -hmm. so that we can have different types of uh our focuses for different types of groups of people if you like uh not in fixed teams they can iterate and move around so you can work on a mission for two cycles and then you could pick up 
uh, pebbles, you might call them, right? Smaller things, and you work on that for 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 a cycle. So that's one part of the answer. I think the other part is that we still like when you were also were there, work with this eighty twenty um, mm -hmm. uh, mix. So eighty percent is uh, is product and or uh, features and and work on that, and we have eighty twenty percent uh, uh, at all times uh, on mm -hmm. tech depth and uh, and and foundation work. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, come on, people, write write a good question. I mean, this is a really a good chance to uh, to write one of the masters of uh, of running a product organization, drilling him for good knowledge. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll have my last question, and I, while I do that, then please do type uh, one yourself, right? Oh, there's one there. Perfect, Gabo. There's a question there. Yeah, Gabo, can you please uh, reiterate your question uh, live so we can hear it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, so if it was answered, then sorry, I will, I will watch the recording, right? <laughs> Uh, but then uh, you were talking about like uh, increasing focus and then uh, organizing teams so they can they can deliver on valuable stuff which yeah. they understand completely. But you also said that you want want to reorganize teams to to understand the, the, the full customer journey, right? And then that that's like the the opposite direction. So it sounds like increasing the cognitive load because me as a as a team or a team member should have a have an overview of, of the work of, of other teams as well and then do you have any any plans on approaching this i believe you do but then what, what are those yeah i think Is there's a i think it i think it's a great question and it's also a question that i uh, i can only partly answer and if we speak again in six months time i might have a completely mm -hmm. different view on it but we haven't gone into this yes yet we are just about to transition into these teams so i think this is uh, this is also re re referring to my disclaimer we have to have that experience to also understand how we should kind of address it but one thought at this point in time is also by hierarchy so we are promoting people internally in the group uh, in the team organization to be having a design and a pm uh, a group PM and a group design lead to take an, uh, a responsibility over more a, a bigger part of of, of the journey um, and to uh, also free them in terms of time to be able to do that so we'll have some people having a different view of scope of, of work so to speak to 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 kind of cover more of, of that strategic level and then collaborating it obviously with the rest of the organization to so that so that uh, so that all the teams can also uh, participate and 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 uh, and enter in with with questions and knowledge and, and experience but i think hierarchy is one uh, answer in, 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 at this point hmm? thank you i know yeah, that, I, I don't know if I missed it, um, but but so you have these missions, you have these cycles that are that are uh, quite a bit bigger than the normal two uh, the two week sprints, and there's a reason that you have the two week sprints is because you you can break the sprints and it's 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 a good small amount. How do you how do you do the entire kind of pre scoping? So you have like this mission, this is the mission we're going on in this cycle. How how, how are you sure that that mission actually? Or the, the feature or whatever you're building actually fits in with that cycle. Do you have some kind of pre chopping up scoping thingy thing? No, but I think it's a good question. I think this is also part of the misunderstanding that we have experienced within the organization. I think the mission is what we try to achieve. And we are not saying that that mission can be achieved within one cycle. We are just saying that this is what we would like to do. And then we use the back brief basically to slice it up and say, okay, in the first cycle, we believe this could be relevant, right? And then we go as far as we can within that, and we descope it if it's too much. I think so far we have actually not been good enough at descoping. So during those cycles, teams have said, "Okay, we need to cut some corners here, and we need to to descope it uh, uh, while in it, so to speak." Um, but uh, experiences shows us that, like in the past six months, we have had some critical, really interesting missions that we have spent three cycles on. 
And now we're at a, a state where we can say, okay, now we believe we can change this focus. The only rule is that after each cycle, we should deliver something of value to the organization. We should be able to just leave it after one cycle. But most of the times we, we, we feel that the mission is so important that we need to invest more. And then we do that. We take another cycle and another cycle. So one cycle doesn't mean one mission. Okay, thanks. Thomas, you have a question? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this when, when you have the team of autonomy. Sorry, I have a misspell that we're autonomous. I forgot the new in the beginning. But <laughs> because that's a challenge for me, because you, it, we were talking about focusing before that you should have mm -hmm. these customer journeys and then you should have the teams able to work on this and then you decide discuss about the pm uh, group pms and group uh, whatever we call them designs or ux or whatever we call them mm. but 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 f for me it's it's more than just taking okay this is the customer journey or whatever you want to call it or or, or a flow for example a process that mm. you should break down and have a team working with separate parts of it so how how do you make that from an, a more technical perspective that the team actually can be autonomous and work. You, you said also you started with this, with the same cadence because that was more easy for you. But uh, I think in the long run you you will have to have different cadences because the work will be different dependent on what you do. And and if I understood your kind of uh, presentation correct, it's quite a simple uh, solution. Mm -hmm. And and if you increase the complexity in these kind of solutions you will definitely need to have different cadence and maybe, maybe even different cycles to be able to deliver the value in the correct way or slice the architecture, the landscape in different ways, which is a huge challenge if you have a legacy landscape to take care of, to consider. So how do you, do you understand? It's, it's quite a big, big question, but for me it becomes then how you think about how do, what kind of work do you do to make the teams actually be autonomous and, and not getting uh, too much dependencies or hard dependencies between each other. I think I think I understand the question, and you're right. I think it is a big one, and I think that the, there's, in my view, at this point in time, not a clear answer. I think we involve engineers. I'm not an engineer myself. We in, in, involve the engineering side very much in this conversation, and I, I don't, I, I feel that the missions as well as the back briefs are written also by the tech leads, not only the PMs, if you like. Um, so I, I think we have a good collaboration on that. And then we have a platform team, which works in a bit of a different uh, cadence, as you're mentioning, uh, and work a bit uh, to enable all the other feature teams, if you like, to be able to do the, that work. I think that uh, is a part of an answer. But I also think that we are, we are not done yet in terms of moving mm -hmm. towards that. I, I still think that we can live without having uh, separate cadences all over the place. But, uh, but just, just, just a follow-up question. Is that platform team uh, similar to, to, because I know more about Spotify than Linus, but the Spotify was also introduced this kind of platform team, which has some kind of more common uh, work tasks that, than a specific team. Is that the same thing you're talking about or is it, to, I don't know if you uh, know Spotify that well. No, I don't. I don't. I, it's basically it's basically a team that have the the feature teams as their customer. They are they are supporting the 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 the, the teams building product uh, with uh, with the tools and better interfaces and better architecture and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, it's kind of a kind of a development platform. It's not a a platform like mm -hmm. a huge uh, monolith. Okay, yeah, I get it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Manus, if I can just help you on the on the architectural side, I think what Linus has done really well uh, from the start is uh, having a solid architectural foundation in place to enable fast cycles. So, for instance, feature flags, um, you know, limiting the amount of work in progress, so it's, you know things are actually released and in production even though they're not enabled for the customer, and so you can you can uh, limit uh, the amount of dependencies or you know, un uncommitted or unmerged uh, things. And I think that actually works tremendously good in, in uh, helping people uh, across teams uh, de-scope the complexity uh, by keeping those technical cycles down and, and, and releasing uh, many times a day. And I, to be honest, I haven't, uh, I haven't worked at a place uh, like Linus that does it like Linus and, and else good as Linus. And I think that actually helps a lot. 
Um, just just to say that there are some architectural things in, in just the process there. Of course, that doesn't uh, say that you don't need architectural foresight. And I think that's where the, uh, the platform team uh, emerged from. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Thank you for adding that, Anders. And I think that perhaps I didn't say, I, I, perhaps it was too implicit that we are releasing uh, uh, all the time. So, so the cadence is more from a market perspective that yeah. when do we release this to the rest of the organization and when do we release it to, to uh, uh, through product marketing. Uh, and you know also case, also case, how, yeah. how how features are rolled out right you know you you have the ability to just say you know only two coaches uh, or one coach have this and then gradually roll it out and and get the feedback and and not yeah. just you know bursting out something that we have no idea from right so so getting that feedback and hypercare uh, and and saying okay now we actually ready to go into either more users or a new market uh, i mean that's entirely up to uh to the teams and marketing teams as well to to decide right and that that actually gives a lot of leverage because you can take some chances uh, on how you do things um, and you can also you know do a wizard of Oz experimentation and handhold things in an excel sheet with a few customers just to begin with uh, while you're you're still learning right and that can go on for a full cycle um, absolutely yeah yeah, yeah yeah so we have a lot of control in that in terms of how do we let it out how do we do our betas and so on and so forth yeah, absolutely. There's one question more. I don't know if we have time for it, but yes. Oh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, Manos. Um, hey. Good to see you. Just, uh, I, I was just curious. You mentioned, I know there were many goals with this and many gaps to cover in the solution, but I got curious that you mentioned that actually at the same time, the value creation as experienced by your customers, the coaches, actually was reported as increased too. And could you connect or share some of the dots as to how and why this framework uh, particularly created that? I think we've been doing good product discovery uh, before as well. So I wouldn't say that this has made uh, kind of the um, the ideas that we are doing uh, better. I think we have had a good culture of doing product a lot due to Anders's work before I joined and, and so on and so forth. So, but there is a, um, there is a, an increase in how the, how, how fast the product has been developed, how we have been able to cover some of the gaps that we have seen mm. from a maturity perspective. Um, and we have both quantitatively seen a growth, uh, prolonged coach, uh, reduce, reduced coach churn or the pr prolonged lifetime. Uh, and we have also seen qual qual uh, qualitatively seen um, the larger coaches being, uh, being uh, you know, uh, rating us higher and, and, and having great feedback on, 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 on those parts. There's a lot of signals related yeah, to yeah. this obviously yeah. and also stuff i don't want to go into here it's uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's 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 very official but i think that um but i think that uh, it has been it's been fruitful but i think there's a main point here regarding the discovery work of the teams i don't think that that, that has been increased so to speak okay thanks then uh, just one question for me then i mean uh, i think for, when i look at this and having been there i think what what you uh, managed to get into the product organization is is a commercial understanding that it was lacking before so you can do a lot of research on users uh, but you know users might actually not know exactly what they want and i think what Linus has is, is also a, a very strong vision uh for how healthcare uh, should be done and 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 you know it's, it's ahead of time, right? Uh, and I, I think embracing that commercial side uh, is, and, and, is, and some that stakeholders can can have uh, an opinion on is uh, is quite significant and and sometimes overlooked, I think, in product organizations. I think that our organization has those two legs, right? We have both a, a technical and a, a commercial uh, leg. And I think, uh, I think um, having clearer touch points, clearer ways of talking about what we can do and how we can do it together makes it easier, makes that communication more fluent and makes them change easier. And I think we could, uh, we can, we can kind of lift easier together in that sense. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's, Part of the benefits of doing it in this in, 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 in this more structured and systematic way, if you like. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Manus. 
It was awesome. Thank you so uh, much for having me and for, for some good questions. Thanks. Awesome. Hang around and uh, let's give him a, an applause. If not on uh, with audio, then uh, then visually. I see you. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, so uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's go to Anas. Uh, Anas Kang uh, has been uh, leading uh, some of the uh, technical and engineering side and data sides of of Luna, the uh, the Danish uh, scale up banking scale up. Uh, Anas, when you're ready, then uh, take it away. Thank you, Anas. I will see if I can. Share my screen. And then while he's doing that, uh, if you believe that this is something that's very interesting, Anas is a mentor on Learning Loop, so you can actually go book him um, today uh, if you are if you want uh, and uh, learn more and, and get his uh, involvement uh, and and take on on, on your uh, problems. Yeah, take it if away. you want to, I'm open. So um, <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Anas. Uh, and I'm, as as the other Anna said, I'm a head of uh, technology and data management at Luna. Um, and I was at one point responsible for building up what we call a squad hub in um, in, uh, in our Copenhagen office. Um, you can all see and hear me, right? Because you're frozen. Is it cool? Great. Um, <clears throat> And I'm, a, I'm actually educated. I'm, 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 a, I'm an engineer uh, of background. I, I got my university degree back in the last millennium. That's how old I am. Uh, and uh, for some reason, even though that I, I always dreamt about uh, creating awesome, cool code, and I actually had the opportunity to do that back in the, working in the games industry, I always end up building teams for some uh, weird reason. Um, so I've been building teams in a, in a company called NDS that is now Cisco. I worked in. in something called CMAX, Balanced Media, TV2, Denmark, Mitchell, Scape and Emily, and right now on Luna Bank. So um, just a, a, a quick uh, slide on um, on Luna Bank, uh, or Luna Way, because we are a technology company. Uh, it, it's a technology company, company called Luna Way that uh, creates technology for finance, which is by coincidence called FinTech. And we also own our only customer, which is Luna Bank. Uh, and this is kind of a, a, I think this slide is a bit old. Things are moving extremely fast uh, as, as in, in these companies. So, but we are like, we have like half a million customers uh, across the Nordics, 400,000 in Denmark and uh, a couple of hundred in Norway and Sweden. Um, we have so make a business bank and we're about 600 employees. Uh, we have uh, been through a lot of, a uh, lot of investment rounds and we've, um, Got a, quite a lot of money invested in us. Um, but the interesting part about uh, Luna is, from my point of view, is this is this is how Luna looks today. So each of these small wonderful icons is each of our squads. So a squad is a tech team. It's very inspired by uh, by the Spotify model. It's a, it's not a tech team. It's a team of uh, of of people working together. So a cross functional team that's working together on domains. Uh, and each of our squads are named after uh, famous NASA missions, and they have a small uh, squad logo as part of the culture that we're building them, that we see them as astronauts that are jumping upon, uh, on board a spaceship. They're sent uh, out on their mission, and they have to do whatever it takes to complete that mission. Uh, and on a space mission, there's nobody who's just an engineer, or just a front end, or just a back end, or just a product person. We are all in this together. So we need to complete the mission. So this is this is the squads that we have today. Um, and when I started in Luna back in uh, May uh, 2021, so one year and eight months ago, um, it looked like this. So back then we had six squads in Luna, and we didn't have any location in Copenhagen, and we didn't have any location in Stockholm. So we basically first of May 2021 there were six squads. And since then, in one year and, and eight months, we've grown to <coughs> throughout these uh, locations, four locations. So it's been a massive, uh, ongoing, and, and really unorganic uh, hyper growth mission we've been uh, we've been on, and it, and it's it's like a wildfire. Uh, it's it's been <coughs> excuse me, it's been really crazy because sometimes when I went to the Oh, office, I see people and like, oh, you're new here. No, I've been working here for half a year. And, and when you have a wildfire like this, 
it burns intensely hot and there's a lot of magic happening in there but you also get really easily burned so that's that's kind of the thing that that that, that occurred to us when we were when we are in this hyper growth uh, thing so what happens when you get burned by a, a, a unorganic a hyper growth wildfire well basically you'll see things like communication breakdowns and you'll see your 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 great talents being uh, uninvolved and their, their frustration and people get stressed because they don't know each other and don't know what the mission is they don't know what the strategy is uh you, you, you have find blind angles where you're just like what is this actually something happening and what is this and and uh, you you actually end up in a and a, a big unalignment and uh, low pro uh, production or productivity. Uh, and basically what, what the, the worst part of all this, when you are in a hyper growth and you get all these, these burns, uh, you have a churn of great talent. You spend so much time on hiring the best talent you can find, and you actually find out they become frustrated because you're hiring so much talent and they, and they churn. So that was kind of, uh, that's kind of one of these problems we have uh, when, when uh, when hyperscaling our, our uh, organizations. Now I'm talking about tech teams right now, but it could be any team uh, out there. Um, so what I, one of the solutions that that can help uh, you not get burned is this peer leadership. And I want to go into since uh, like Anna said in the beginning of this, we we, we don't want to go through the theory too much. We actually want to go into pragmatic solutions here. So I'm going to go through a case where we. Uh, evolve peer leadership in Luna, but uh, before we do that, we need to really, and that's something that a lot of people forget from time to time, forget about the difference between management and leadership, because there's a huge difference between management and leadership. At one point, I thought it was the same. I think there's a lot of American companies that think it's the same, uh, but we need to be very, very clear about what's the difference between management and leadership. By the way, if you have any questions, just put up your hand and, and ask them, because or else I'll just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And I need time to bring some coffee as well. So if you have any questions, please go ahead. So the difference between management and leadership. Of course, you're all smart people. So this is just a reminder. Um, so management is basically the practice of uh, of planning and organizing and controlling and, and uh, making sure that people get their salary and making sure that the, they sign up when they're ill and and, and the, the, the thing is that management is actually the execution of power. I have the power or you, I control what you're doing, when you're planning, what you, when you can have your holiday, when these things. And management, because it's an execution of power, very often follows the org chart. So a manager is a person that has power over the, over the people underneath them. And management is all, very often also just a one-way thing. I manage you, you do what I plan and, and control and organize. Of course, there's a lot of, I've, I've sounded a bit uh, Trump era uh, like right now, but but of course, there's good ways of doing management. There's servitude management and management by wandering around and all these wonderful things about management. But in, at the end of the day, management is uh, the execution of power. Um, so uh, leadership uh, and management is something managers do. That's pretty clear. So leadership. Well, leadership is 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 uh, actually uh, the <laughs> it, it, it's 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 the non uh, I, I think it's pretty wrong what I wrote here, but but it's actually what you do when you do leadership. You actually go through you guide people and you you have visions and you you communicate strategy and then you you kind of get people to follow. You lead people in a certain direction. In some sense, you manipulate people in a certain direction. Uh, manipulation is not a bad thing right here. It's actually helping people to understand the real world based on the knowledge that you have in order for them to make right decisions. So management is not the execution of uh, power, it's the execution of influence. Uh, and, oh, sorry, um, I've, I've written management here. I actually mean leadership, sorry. It's not management, it's leadership is the execution of influence. Leadership is uh, uh, often doesn't follow the old chart. So leadership is something that can happen up, down, left side, right side, uh, all the way through. Uh, so And it's multi-directional. So it's not, if I'm sitting and leading uh, Maunus, uh, he can also lead me. Uh, so it's not something that you do since it's, there's no power hierarchy between it. Then it's something that everybody can do to each other. So leadership is, is what you do uh, in order to help your uh, everybody around you in your job and in your life and your family to succeed. 
So this is the difference between management and leadership. So we're talking about leadership now, even though there are written management there. So um, of all of these different leaderships, uh, peer leadership is actually one of the is is one of the most challenging time uh, ways of doing leadership. Uh, but it's also possibly one of the most effective ways of doing leadership. So why is it so uh, so damn hard to do peer leadership? Well, first of all, there's no base of power to lead from. So it's not like you have you have a, an obligation or, or, a, a, or, or it's not part of your job description to be a leader. It's something you do. It's not something you do with the, hey, I will lead you now. So it's very, very hard because you are on, on the same level as the other people that that you that that you that you lead, um, and 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 because you're on the same level, there's no distinguishing factors between who is the leader right now and who is being led. Uh, this can change uh, any any given time of the day. You could be a leader and the other one can be led, but it can also be the other way around. Um, and it's also very hard to figure out uh, when it's okay for you to lead your peers. When am I stepping over their boundaries? When am I actually going in and say, hey, let me try to lead you. Let me try to, to help you with this because maybe they don't want to be helped. Um, 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 so so, so it's, 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 it's kind of hard. And, and in order for people to be led by their peers, um, it actually demands a lot of respect and trust uh, and empowerment, uh, both from the leader and from the led person. Because I want to be sure as a person that's being led by you, that I can trust that you want the best for me and not for yourself. Unfortunately, we live in organizations that are political and 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 uh, do people actually want the best for me or do they want the best for themselves? There's mistrust because we've all been burned. Um, so so it, it requires a huge amount of respect and trust and empowerment to to uh, between the parties, the leader and the led. So that is why this is this is particularly hard to do these things to lead your peers. Uh, in that way. So, um, but it is extremely powerful because if we get to a point where we respect each other and we have the the, the, the possibility to lead each other, that 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 then it's a it's basically everybody helps each other and it becomes this synergetic kind of uh, place where there's so much trust and 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 patience and and helpfulness in that environment that you become much more productive. So how do you create this culture of peer leadership that actually makes your company bloom and makes sure that you don't get burned uh, by the by the hyper growth wildfire? Well, as I said, I want to go into one of my experiences at Luna. Um, uh, so so just to, to set up what 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 happened uh, or what what my journey in Luna has been. So basically, um, Back in February, a couple of years ago, the CTO of Luna called me up and asked me if I wanted to take on this challenge to start up and build out the tech hub in Copenhagen. Uh, and, I, and the goal was to have 50 talents in that tech hub within a year. So it was a massive uh, achievement that I had to, to, to go into. And I basically told him, because it, it was interesting, and Luna is a, is a, is a bloody interesting place, um, I, I told him that uh, I would uh, I would I would check that challenge, but I had to. He, he couldn't question the way that I did it or how much money I spent on it, uh, because there was kind of this thing that if I saw that it because it was hyper scaling and, and 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 dangerous, if I saw that we needed to basically say okay, we're gonna just take off fucking two days and go on somewhere and do something in order to 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 regain the trust in each other, then we should do that. And luckily. Luna is a place where they believe in uh, in people, and I was allowed to to start my journey uh, with growing up this uh, tech hub. Um, now, after I, I accepted the, the the challenge, I kind of said, "Okay, well, how the how the how the hell am I going to do this?" Because first of all, I'm, I'm it's pretty scary to to go out and hire fifty people and know how much time it takes to hire people. It takes a lot of time from you. It really, really is a time consuming. Uh, not a grinding process of hiring people, especially in an environment that is as bloody red as the environment we are we are navigating in right now, where engineers basically it's very much a, a, a biased market. Um, so, so I, I knew that it would be a, a long struggle, and I, I just couldn't figure out how can I build up a, a good culture and a good organization while 
being in job interviews all the time. Um, so I needed help. And, and I didn't know who to, I, I started the 1st of May in, in, and was standing in an office and built, basically there was an office in, Luna had an office in Copenhagen, but I, I had to build my 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 table uh, the first day and kind of how, how the fuck do I do this? So the the, the key in, in, in my head was, okay, I also believe in very close leadership and I believe that people should be close to, to the people that they lead. And I could also see that while I was running around trying to hire a lot of people, who would lead the people that are already hired? So I wanted to build a team uh, that had a culture uh, that was founded in, in trust and respect. Uh, and I wanted to make the people that was in that team uh, responsible for ensuring that the team had a culture of uh, trust and respect. So basically the first thing I, I said to everybody, the, and I knew that the first batch of people that I hired in was really the most important. So the, 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 the first thing I told these people is that I cannot do this myself. I, 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 it's impossible. So you guys need to chip in on this. You need to be leaders from day one, even though that you're hired as a front-end engineer, back-end engineer, or whatever you are. And, and that was the, the importance of finding in the, in the first batch of people. So, um, and, and then I thought, okay, if, if you're gonna build up a, a culture where, where peer leadership can, can be nursed and we have this respect, then it starts before we even hire the people. Um, so it starts, all the way the first time we meet the new potential talents um and the, the first thing i kind of laid down to to the to 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 my to the, the the few people i hired to begin with was that there's nothing more important than hiring the right people in the right positions so rule number one was uh you cannot if somebody comes and asks you for help you cannot say no uh we always have time to help and we so so that that was the first thing and that, and by basically saying that, and everybody agreed that, yeah, of course we should help each other. I also uh, planted the, the the foundation of um, when I come and ask for help for a job interview, I don't really care what you're doing right now. You need to jump out of that and help me with that job interview, because it's important that we find the right people that you can work with. Um, so, so that was kind of one of the rules, and everybody agreed on that. So, um, so, so it all started with the job interviewing process, and that's actually what I'm going to walk you through right now. So I'm going to go through the steps of the of the job interview process that we that we merged in Luna, um, and and it's it's built on a process that we already had our talent acquisition team in, in in Aarhus doing, and we just refined that very much with all the knowledge I had from from uh, an experience I had from building other teams of other places. So first thing first. So basically, I, I didn't want to spend time on hiring people. I wanted the team to hire people. So the initial talk with the candidate, we had we had people coming in, and and the initial talk was about half an hour hour where I just talked to the candidate, and we didn't talk about much. We basically just talked about, hey, who are you? How are you doing? It was kind of a chemistry talk. So I, I basically that I, I I I validated is this a person that I want to to spend more time on, or is it a person I don't want to spend more time on, or I don't want the team to spend more time on. And if that first interview went well, I um, I kind of asked for the favor. And this is something that, that a lot of companies do when they hire tech people. They ask them to do a, a coding challenge. They ask them to do some tests. Now, the, 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 the way we talked about these tests and these coding challenges to the, the potential new talent was not, OK, we're going to test you to see how good you are. We actually explicitly said, this is very, very simple. We're not looking for any particular person. We're not looking for anybody with a particular intelligence. This is just a test to see who, what, what kind of guy you are. And so the cognitive test and, and the personal identif identification test is just because we want to see who you are. We're just curious about what a wonderful person you are. And the code challenge was also very, very uh, strictly announced that don't spend more than four hours on it. This, this, is, this, is, just, this is just things we're doing so we when you come in and meet us on the on, on the, the, the what we call the demo day which is a terrible word because it's neither a demo or day um when you come in there we have something to talk about so it doesn't get embarrassing so that's basically what we what we what we talk to tell about it's this is just about us having a chat so they did these things we hire we invite them in for the demo day that is not a demo day uh, but a couple of hours where they meet uh, where they come in and and at the intro, so this is this is one very important thing. So we want these people to understand the new talents, to understand that we have a transparent and respectful relationship to each other. Um, so 
we we sit down at the intro which is just like 15 minutes when they come in um and we show them my or their new managers uh, person identicator and their new managers cognitive test so i've been sitting with new talents and showing them what my iq is basically and showing them that i'm this kind of person and this is where i really really am bad at stuff and this is where i'm really really good at stuff so we have a conversation where we just stand there nude in front of each other not literally speaking but we we show each other who we are because that sparks the trust and the interest and see hey we're all in this together we're just humans so once we kind of broken down the the, the the fact that people are nervous going to a job interview by showing who we are then we let the the, the new talent into an, the, the next step of the process which was basically talking to two people and this is important these are two uh, two people that are not going to be part of the team they're going to be the new talent is going to be part of but just part of the department and basically we wanted people who weren't the same uh that weren't if you if we were hiring a front-end coder we didn't want to have two front-end coders sitting talking to them this was just about culture and the intro to this to this uh, meeting was okay this is the time where you can ask all the questions you're afraid to ask me about so get the truth about this is not a sales pitch this is just two people sitting and talking to you and 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 finding finally we have some questions and there was a lot of crazy questions so this is basically just what are we who are you who are we um after one hour of uh, of talking to two uh, two talents in the in the department they get another hour where they talk to two tech people so two people that really are tech people that understands their code and understands what what kind of persons they are so if it's a front-end developer we are we're looking for it's two front-end developers sitting there and they are looking at the code challenge but the important thing again is the narrative of why why we're looking at this code challenge so the narrative narrative that we found was the best narrative is imagine that you're sitting with your colleagues on a friday afternoon drinking beers and you had this wonderful crazy uh, thing that you had to solve and code this last week what do you talk about when you sit there on this friday and it's like oh so you did this oh wow well, well have you thought about doing that oh that was wonderful hey this is a great creation so we also the, the 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 two people that were doing the interview actually was trained to talk like you're sitting at a bar right now uh and and talking you're just friends right now so through that process actually at the end i'll just i'll just go back to what is that we learned from this process because there's a lot of it, it's, it's finely tuned how we're doing this uh, after they talk to the to the coders uh i will have an in, an outro with the, with the candidate and i will say so are you okay it's an intensive two hours you've been through are you okay are we okay and also tell them so now you met us if you don't want to play with us anymore that's fine that's super awesome thank you for saying that you don't want to be part of of this journey because it can be very uh, extreme to be part of this journey and we are just happy that because we learned uh, we, we got to know a new person so we sent the person out with a uh, with with a feeling of yes no matter what you answer right now we are good so if the person after this uh, this meeting said yes i would actually like to continue the conversation i would always promise them that i will call them back the day after with either um, a, 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 a job offer or a, a, and, and, and basically we cannot work with you but i also told the, the I also always tell the candidate that it has absolutely so so when we decide who wants who we can work with it's not because of that person it is it's because it can be because we are not ready for it we can maybe not take a junior engineer in right now because we're super busy doing some stuff so we just don't have the time to make this junior engineer a success so that was kind of the conversation with them right after this uh, demo day we sent the candidate on their merry way and then we sit down for uh, for some time because as our cto and luna told me when i started in luna managers don't hire talent teams does so all these people have talked to the talent and we sit down for a, a, a small hour and the first thing we do in this meeting is that all the people who have met the talent and i'm not included in that as the manager does a vote and i shit you not what we do is a thumbs up or a thumb down everybody puts their 
hand in front of the camera or in front of the, each other and they say three two one and either put a thumb up or a thumb down there's no middle man and the question of putting a thumb up and thumb down is do we believe that this talent can become a success in luna it's not a question of do we think this person is really really good do we think this person is really really cool um okay honest <laughs> no worries um so so it's can we do we believe that we can make this person a success because that's what it's all about it's making other people a success and if people vote up and down and sometimes we all agree and everything is good sometimes we don't agree uh but at the end of the day these people we have a discussion where these people kind of decide or the the, the talents already in the partner decide you know what we think that this person can become a success and at that point we have the next step of this indoctrination of people starting to trust each other and being part of a team so if they decide that they want to commit to making this person a success i ask them so the two people that had the culture interview with the candidate i look at them and say i this is a blood oath basically <laughs> if we fail if we lose this person when they start in luna because of some cultural bullshit then it's on you guys. Are you willing to take the responsibility to make sure that this person becomes success in Luna uh, culture-wise? And they say yes. And the same thing I ask the coders. Are you willing to, to, to stake uh, something, peers, whatever, on that you this person will become a success in Luna uh, and not fail because of some code stuff? And right there, I have four people that say, yes, we are committed to the success of this, this candidate. After we came to that point, we always take like half an hour to discuss how can we do this better? How can we refine our, our, our uh, interview uh, process? How can, what did went wrong in the interview process and stuff like that? So we continue to have refined this. So this, there's a lot of things happening right here. And, 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 and why are we doing all these things? So, and what does that actually do with peer leadership? Well, what we gain from this is twofold. So the talent that comes in uh, from the get-go, because we as managers stand naked in front of them, we gain trust. So we gain a trust in that we are also just people and they, they are not nervous, uh, that everybody has shortcomings. So here's the foundation, the trust. Do you remember the foundation for good peer leadership? Trust, respect, empowerment. So here we start building the trust uh they the talent actually feel that they are committed to the people who has done the interview because they know that it's the people who's done the interview and not me that's that decides if if we can work with that person so there's already a commitment from the talent and and almost a, a gratefulness from the talent once they start to these four people that has that has decided his his or her faith uh they also get to know the organization much better they meet a lot of people it's awesome they they get an understanding they meet different people then they they see the the entire diversity of the the, the the department so again we are all different people and it's okay um and what and and what also happens for the talent is that when the talent starts in luna you already have four people that are committed to your success it's so much easier to come into a company where you know there's four people that are committed to you becoming a success. And there we have the trust and we have the respect already built into the person, even the day, the days before they start. So how does this work for the, for the team? Well, the team feel empowered because I go to the team and say, you know what, guys, I'm not going to decide who's going to work with you. You decide. I trust you guys in, in deciding who's going to work with you because you spend eight hours a day with these people, not me. So the team feels empowered. Um, uh, the, the, the people who wasn't part of the, the recruitment process also respects the people who was part of the recruitment process and trust them in making the right decisions for the entire department. And also you get, you get the, 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 the people who sit in the interviews, you get them again and again and again tell the story about Luna. So they remind themselves why they are at Luna. Because they don't sit there and tell the wrong, the bad story about Luna. They tell themselves the good story. So they tell people, so they continuously remind themselves. So it's an echo chamber of reminding yourself, why the fuck am I doing this eight days, eight hours a week? Or it's eight hours, more than eight hours a week. 
in our day. So you get like this joint communication and joint narrative and joint storytelling that gets continuously uh, told uh, to each other and everybody kind of starts feeling that. Uh, and they also feel that they're dedicated to new team members. So just in this, all in all, four hours of recruitment process, five hours of recruitment process, there's so many factors we built in to create this trust and respect and empowerment to team members. And once there's trust, respect and empowerment in team members, they will start leading each other, which is very powerful. Um, so how do we see this respect every day? Uh, and this is actually a quote that we, we went to a bar at one point and I was like really, really happy about how we grew as much as we, we did. Um, so so I, I, I talked to one of the, the, the people from the first batch and said, what the fuck are we doing here? Why, why, why is this so nice? And she said, well, have you forgotten us? We all chose each other. We all chosen each other. So everybody feels that they chosen each other in this entire department. So, so what we gain here is that we gain less stress because suddenly you have the people that sit next to you every single day knowing you and understanding you and respecting you and know that you're allowed to say something to each other they will see if the other person is, is starting to have stress symptoms they care about the other person from the get-go and that means that i don't have to as a manager i don't need to be there and do the close leadership i have the entire team sitting and doing the close leadership and remember the story i said before about we're all in this together we're in a rocket ship we're astronauts if we don't help each other then we'll fail the mission that is embedded into them. So you suddenly you get uh, you, you get a notion of actually understanding when people are starting to have stress before they actually do have it. We have less communication uh, breakdown. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different other uh, cultural events like the hub date. I'll get back to that in a bit. Um, where we have this communication and a circle of trust because everybody starts trusting each other. So they're also okay to say, you know what? I don't feel comfortable in what we're doing right now. I don't feel comfortable with you guys. I, I feel comfortable about this. So you gain this uh, trust of communicating better um, and you get this involvement, which basically because everybody wants to be part of, of, uh, of other people's success and, and help other people to become a success. And basically what, what, what happens there is that we get this less churn, we get more trust, we get more respect and more empowerment, and we do not get burned in the same way by the wildfire of uh, hyperscaling. Um, so I just wanted to fast uh, to, to go into some other efforts that we've been doing in order to have this peer recognition and get this respect and trust and empowerment. As I said, we had the hub date. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful, we had a hub and we updated the hub. So it was a hub date and we did it on a Friday afternoon. So it was a date, wonderful marketing uh, phrase, but it's basically a, a place where everybody met up and on Friday, every two weeks, we meet up every two weeks and we sit down and we talk about different uh, things. And we sit and talk about uh, successes and failures. And we also talk about what rumors have you heard? Is there anything there? And I'm, I'm actually standing, often managers are standing in that meeting and say, this is what I know. Have you heard anything, any rumors, whatever? Then I, I can tell you what it is. Let's kill the, the, the ghost of rumors. So the, it creates a circle of trust. Again, it's me as a, as a, as a manager and a leader to, to kind of say, this is what I know. That's just being transparent. Uh, so that's the hub date. We have snitching for the win, uh, which is basically it's okay to snitch on your um, on your teammates, and especially if you feel that the teammates are going down with stress, or if they don't uh, feel that they they don't you don't seem to feel all right, or they have been gone for some time, um, and then you don't understand why they've been ill too much, then it's okay to go to your manager and say, hey, you know what, I'm a bit concerned about my um, my teammate. Uh, and that is a positive thing to snitch about the teammates in that way. I tried it myself where my, the CTO at one point said, you know what, uh, your colleague told me that, that you look really, really tired at the moment. What, what's up with you? And to be, when, when the first time it happened to me, it was like, hey, why the fuck does he bother uh, if I'm not doing my job proper or whatever? But then I found out it was actually him just caring for me. So, so this snitching for the win was, is, is, is a part of it. Uh, calm your FOMO, um, that's also a really, really uh, a, a thing. So when you hyperscale, suddenly you, you, you are in a situation where you normally just could talk 
you can you can you can figure out what is happening in the entire office just by standing around the, the water cooler or the coffee machine, because everybody around the coffee machine can kind of kind of uh, decide everything and know what is happening in the entire company or people standing outside and smoking. Uh, and suddenly, when things are happening so many places in the organization, you 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 feel that you're missing out. Oh, hey, I was part of this once. I was actually the guy who was in, involved in this. And now they're suddenly just doing that without asking me. How dare they? I, I, I didn't want to do the job, but now they're doing it without me. How dare they actually do that? And you get this FOMO, uh, fear of missing out on all the things that is happening around. And basically, at one point, uh, it's just the fact that you cannot relate and understand everything that's happening in the organization. So you need to learn to control your fear of missing out in all the things that is around. You should not know everything. You don't know everything. And it's okay that you don't know everything. Maybe you should just focus on the things you have right now, and you will get the information if it's needed. It's also a great way to kill rumors. Uh, so, so calm your FOMO is is is. We're really, really. We had a great conversation about actually putting that into one of our core values in Luna. That just it's okay that that things are happening that you're not a part of. Um, the last thing I just want to mention here is is our all staff hackathon. So normally, we have the two hackathons a year in um, in Luna uh, and in many places. And it was like that once that it's only the tech department moving, uh, going on hackathons, uh, because then they sit out in some cabin and they're doing the stuff. We actually in Luna uh, have a tech department and hangarounds going on hackathons. And we have like the product people and the um, uh, basically whoever wants to be part of this, but they need to uh, add something to the hackathon. So we have product people doing UX work, or we have uh, UX sitting down and doing some front end uh, coding, and we kind of back end us doing product work. So we kind of try to mix the entirety up in our hackathons um, in order to kind of create this relationship uh, that, that uh, breaks down barriers and that is okay to also lead outside your own organization. Um, so that's, I think that was kind of it right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I hope that you, that you understand that this is, this is something that I've, that I've normally only talk about and never ever done on a slide deck. And it's something that I talk a lot about, uh, and people are really, really tired about it. So I hope that it wasn't too confusing. Um, but I know that Anas is going to ask for takeaways, because that's what he does. So my takeaways, three takeaways. First of all, be authentic and transparent and present. Uh, it's very, very important that 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 you don't, uh, if if you're not a person that likes to open up. Uh, your your faults then don't be don't do it but you beat you need to be authentic in what you do this i think this is a given for everybody that that we need to be be there and be uh, transparent and authentic in what we do um it's okay to trust and empower your team to execute leadership it should not be uh it it, 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 it can be scary but leadership is not a dangerous thing. Leadership is where we help each other. I get led by my team every day. So as long as you get into this understanding uh, that leadership is something that you can do, everybody can do, then it's okay to trust and empower your teams to do it. And take baby steps uh, towards it, but you need to trust them because they're actually adults. And you hire, uh, hopefully you hire really, really brilliant people because you believe they can do something. And uh, also it is not enough to just do leadership. You need to execute management as well. Because sometimes leadership can be just people discussing and kind of, oh, these soft values. And sometimes somebody just needs to go around and say, okay, you know what, this is what we're going to do. Because if you don't do that, then you lose kind of track on things. So, so management is also an extremely important thing that you need to execute from time to time. So I think that's my takeaways. Um, yeah. Awesome. I'm going to. Thank um, you so much. Stop sharing. So, so, yeah. so you know also the next question that I'm going to ask right like what what would what? your advice be to somebody doing this for the first time oh i, I honestly I, I, uh i actually think it, it, it's it's it, it's just kind of i i think that that it's kind of letting go and just saying okay what how would i feel comfortable in being introduced into something how how do i Make sure that 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 people get an understanding of we're all in this together. Um, I, again, I think it's back to the authentic authenticity part of it, um, and just try. And the thing is that you can try something, and if it doesn't work, then hey, don't do it. Do something else. Isn't that what we do when we develop projects? Kill your babies and kill your darlings and and uh, fail fast and stuff like that. I think it's it just 
approach and an agile, agile way of doing it. Um, but also acknowledge that this is not something for this is not something for everybody. Hmm. That there are, and that's again why management is, is as as important. It's not something that everybody feel comfortable in doing. And if you don't feel comfortable in doing this, then there's tons of other ways to succeed as well. It's a, I think it's a very radical uh, approach, right? That that can be daunting for a lot of people. Uh, so I think me included need to wrap my head around this uh, a bit because it, it just changes the whole dynamics of a lot of things. Uh, people, please uh, do write questions if you're interested in this or have any uh, any questions on it. Uh, I'll just uh, go ahead with the next question and and hope that you guys are are busy typing uh, now. But but Anna's. Uh, Oh, there is actually one um, from Gabo. Oh. Perfect. Take it away, Gabo. If okay. you're there. So actually, yep. two questions. Two, yeah, yeah, two, two questions actually. Uh, yeah. The first one is like, have you experienced any any hard limit in in hop size? So like, oh, we grew over this point, like over I don't know 50, 150, whatever. I don't know how many are you, but uh, this this limit was was a limit. Like, if there was a break there, was there any number like that? Um, we we uh, so beside the, the the logical divisions in squats, which is a basic team size of uh, seven plus minus two, then we also divide uh, multiple squats into colonies. So again, all the space names and stuff like that. So it's it's kind of a space colony uh, that 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 is consists of, of I don't know up to at max seven squats or something like that. Uh, that works within a, a, the same area of domains. So we we do domain-driven design. So each uh, squad has an X amount of domains and bounded context around that. And then we collect the domains in the colonies. And actually, then each then a, a group of colonies are under what we call an area. And in Luna, we have four areas. We have the the customer area, area which is basically just customer experience or, or all the customer the app. Let's just call it the app. Um, well, that's, that's actually our product area. So product area is the app. That's that's what our customers see. Then we have the the customer area, which is basically our entire uh, CRM and automation and uh, all the stuff that happens. The operations part of actually having customers and serving customers is uh, service uh, our our service agents. It's our back office. Our uh, financial crime prevention uh, when we need to do risk uh, stuff and like that. Then we have the banking area, which is our core banking area. So basically, transferring money for A, from A to B, uh, compliance, uh, um, SWIFT, all these wonderful core banking stuff. And then we have the empower area. And empower is a, is a quite interesting area. So we, from the get go, Luna has uh, decided to to create to empower people to do or develop us as much as possible. So we have four, five squads sitting in in, in the empower area. Just building developer tools. It's probably one of the, some of the smartest people in Luna is sitting just doing developer tools, uh, developer experience, um, uh, automatic Kubernetes clusters, uh, cloud scaling, security, uh, all these things. Because in Luna, we believe, and that's actually our unique selling point, I think, we believe uh, because we're a technology company that we can do and that everything should be, should, should should be uh, done by technology. So all manual processes, all the, the developers should focus on developing stuff and not anything else. We also have very strict re requirements regarding by build a buy, but that's an entirely different story. So since we have these logical, uh, multiple logical scales that we, we haven't seen in the hard size of a hub, uh, people working in colonies uh, are also cross location. Uh, so we have different squads in different locations that work uh, in a colony. We even actually have a cross uh, cross location squads, so people working in the same squad in Aarhus and in uh, in Copenhagen and Stockholm. So I, I, we haven't seen a hard size yet. Oh, but we've seen you, hard size. With that, mm -hmm. with that you answered every question on the planet, including mine. And, <laughs> and, then, and then there there's another one. Uh, like I I've experienced like this type of, of organization before, where right? like we, we, we were super empowered to, to organize our life, including hiring and uh, and everything like that. But then where it ended up is that uh, there there was there were heavy heavy conflicts at, at some point uh, between 
like top management or, or business leadership because of the the aggressive expansion goals and uh, the other side of, of the situation was was obviously the level of empowerment and people wanting to create psychological safety for themselves and they had different goals and all that and they like each of the goals were valid i would say but also business goals were valid because mm. that's how the company generates profit so like, do, you, do you experience any any kind of yeah so one of the context one of the conflicts we have actually have, and this is not about the, the house cleaning, it's kind of part of our culture. So we see each squad as an autonomous squad. So we basically see them as, as they themselves can decide how and what they do. So basically, if they want to build stuff in PHP, go ahead, build stuff in PHP if you want to do this or that. So the squads are empowered by themselves. Um, and we sometimes see the conflict of them not understanding that they are not totally autonomous uh, because if they were totally autonomous they would uh, build other stuff than we actually want from the business so it's kind of these guardrails but and when we have sometimes seen the conflict of teams believing that they can decide themselves what they're doing because we give them the freedom and the empowerment um and and to be honest we we sometimes have to kind of give them a, a, a good tap on the head and say yeah cool it's fine you can build them whatever you want but here are the guardrails, here are the limits. But I, I must admit that, yes, we have seen these conflicts uh, coming up um, and, and uh, more and more uh, as we have grown, uh, we've seen that that strategy is, is super powerful uh, and strategy, lack of strategy eats culture for breakfast, actually. So <laughs> culture eats strategy for breakfast, but lack of strategy eats culture for breakfast because if you don't have any strategy, <laughs> you don't have any vision, you don't know where you're going, then you have all these autonomous a small colonies doing whatever they want and then then productivity fails so yes we've seen these conflicts and we are continuously working on uh, on aligning on them and and, and, um, and removing those things i'm glad you you mentioned that um i think like especially about the the the, the alignment because you talked mostly about autonomy uh, and, mm. and and not so much about especially you know the strategic alignment you know like product business alignment also like what are we working on like how, how do you go around that how do you how do teams know that they're adding value to the to the shared vision and direction well they they don't always uh add value or no uh <laughs> no and uh, <laughs> most of the time that value um we we have uh so so in we we're trying very much to show, especially these empower teams and core teams, core banking teams, they sometimes don't feel that they add value because what is celebrated in the company is the production, uh, the product uh, stuff. Oh, we made this great uh, new page or we did made this new product. And there's some people sitting down underneath and say, yeah, but we built a core bank. Without us, it couldn't even work your stuff, mm. right? So, so we and then we had had we we, some, we try to figure out what is actually our key value indicator. Uh, what, what, what is what is it? Is it uh, monthly active users? Is that a, is that a KPI that we like, or is it uh, ARPU? Or what, what is it actually that that is the that is a, 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 a the, the purpose of value? So value can be many things. Of course, at the end of the day, it's money on on the uh, at the end of the day. In the bottom line but what is the value and how can we find some values that everybody can relate to uh so so yes we have it it, it is sometimes very hard to, to get people to understand that their little what is my little piece in this huge machinery mm. what is that actually i create um for example what uh, a thing right now is that we uh we're trying to get uh, the teams that create data to understand so 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 get teams to understand that this little data point that you're creating down here in in the suburbs of something like uh squad skylab that are doing car transactions okay this particular data point it is actually being propagated and propagated and end up in this value generating thing so the lineage of data flowing down so the squads get the ownership of data and understand that this exact data point is actually reused all these places and creates this value that is something we're actually trying to use data lineage as a as a, a indicator of what value am i creating so what we did in, in linux was to you know implement the data guys within the other teams 
so that they could both uh, you know teach and understand, but also that we could kind of distribute the knowledge of how to do data, how to do tracking, how to do everything, uh, how to work with with the platform, data platform. Like, do you combine teams in that way, or like how do you yeah. make so, sure? So, so the teams, the teams are multi uh, are cross functional. So some teams we actually have have squads that doesn't even have tech in them. Um, so so it's it's, it's very cross functional teams. Um, the, 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 for instance, talking about data analytics guys embedded in a team, so we have like in our um, onboarding squads, so Phoenix and, uh, and uh, mostly Phoenix actually, uh, Dragonfly also, but our onboarding squads have data engineers or data scientists sitting in them. So what they do is that they create a lot of operational data that the data uh, scientists sit and, and work with them on. And okay, so we create this and this is our KYC data and this is what we know about our customer. That data actually gets automatically put into a data analytics platform. So they are the source for data in the data analytics platform, where the same data scientists are doing all these wonderful machine learning models and whatever on top of it, and sending it back into the squad. So the data scientist in the squad is both the producer of data and the consumer of data, uh, and, and mm -hmm. but sitting day to day in the squad. So yes, we, we have data, but we actually, um, uh, so the entire, the entire data stewardship is something that we want to force more down to the squads for the, them to understand how to work with data and become more data centric. That is what I'm spending a lot of hours on trying to do. <laughs> All right, anybody else with questions? Cool. Time away. Otherwise, I, I, can, I can just ask for hours. But uh, I, I'd rather hear from somebody else. Actually, one thing that, that regarding this, um, uh, in before when we asked about what's the biggest problems right now, this uh, this question, I, I think it was was Gabo that asked that question, or who was it uh, that asked the question uh, about, or said that one of the biggest uh, challenges is commitment from tech squads and uh, and alignment with tech yeah. squads and understanding that. Um, it, it, I, I couldn't stop smiling about that because that is actually one of the problems that we also have because we have like big journeys, product journeys and, and visions that is, is, so in order to fulfill those, let's call them missions like you do, uh, Manus. So in order to fulfill those missions, we have 27 different squads that need to be involved in that. And we need to go down and get 27 different squads to fit it into there uh roadmap or is it even 27 or is it just 13 of the squads that needs to do this because what domains does this so it's really really hard sometimes to uh, to just untangle the kind of a, okay we need this and what is the dependency here and get the commitment and the understanding from these very complicated uh, uh sub teams and and uh, on how we can get the commitment and the teams are sudden are often pretty scared of committing to stuff because they know there's so many moving parts and so i totally can relate from a from the other side uh, about this, it's really, really hard to understand the, the, the mission and vision of the, the of the product teams and then get the everyday engineer, uh, Carl Kohler, to sit and understand how do we commit to this big plan. So that's actually also one of the problems that we see uh, from time to time. That was, it was, it was an interesting question that has, but I think we all have been there, I guess. All right. There's uh, one last question unanswered. It's uh, it's from me, so I'll take it. I will take it unless there's somebody else. But like, how do you ensure that when you have this peer uh, leadership where a lot of people are involved, uh, that 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 people don't feel overlooked because one person saw that you know this person is doing good, but uh, it might not be visible to uh, the line manager or to other people giving input, uh, like. How do you make sure that the good that they deliver toward one peer will uh, will not go unnoticed by another, you know, and possibly the one paying for the for the salary? Uh, well, it since we it, it is hard, and some people actually do feel that they are overlooked because they are just a small pick in a in a in a big machine, yeah. but. Uh, so we have, like, like I said, the hop date, which is a ceremony uh, where everybody is together. Each colony and each squad have their own ceremonies where they communicate these things. And and I try as a as a manager. I know that we so basically we have 
we also have guilds where we do cross squads communication back and guilds for the front and guilds and whatever where they also celebrate uh victories so we try to create the the spaces where everybody can be heard and also we from from this snitching for the win kind of thing it, it people also very much help each other and say okay this guy was actually sitting all alone and wasn't presented in this particular where he'd done something great so this hey can somebody please help this guy i had a, a there was actually a person starting in in in, the, in luna that we were just about to lose um until we found out that she, basically she, she was sitting a bit alone and and we found out that she was a smoker and and she always went down to smoke when uh, alone and i actually um, somebody came to me and said hey can can we please get the other people that are smoking just invite her down to smoke with us mm -hmm. so we can hear her story and i was like that was a snitch and it was like yeah of course we can it's just something that we forgot because we're so many people and we're so busy with everything so that's kind mm -hmm. of these these things where we where we actually help promoting each other and and another thing that that is also where where i've sometimes been extremely um Oh, I'm very, very firm in that. Whenever we write something in Slack and celebrate something, we never, ever, ever write names of people. We write teams and we don't use I, we always use we. So there's a culture of actually always writing we and the team name and not the person doing stuff. Do you uh, care about performance? Yes, I care about performance. The Luna on us definitely cares about performance. Um, uh, I, I I think that this 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 ends down in in this kind of uh, back to people working remote and and do we trust them in performing when they work work remote? I I, I care. I, I trust people to perform because they have other people reliant on them that they trust and care about. So if you're sitting in a team of of of, uh, of of squaddies that has trust to you, you want to perform because you want to help your teammates. You don't want to let your teammates down. Uh, so so, but I do care about performance, and and and, but it's not something. I, and this this should be an entire another meetup about how yeah. do we measure performance of of uh, how do we measure performance of a, of a of a UXer, right? How 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 do we do that? They, they do they just sit and, and over sparkle uh, the UX designs or do they just go sketches? How do you measure the performance of that, right? It's 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 so hard to measure performance in it's in, also two different paradigms meeting and clashing, right? I think that's super interesting. That's why I'm asking it, because I'm asking from another paradigm. Yeah. Um yeah. Um super people interesting and thought provoking. I think uh, also a little, little bit of like holacracy uh, thinking in there. I think uh yeah, absolutely. I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it was uh, very thoughtful and thought provoking. It's, uh, it's great to see. There's a lot of things in there that is uh, really exciting also to uh, to hear about. I had I had yeah. one question regarding the last thing you m mentioned when you say we always use we whenever you use I. We always talk about the team and not the individual. So being a, such a big team, how do you kind of how do you make sure also in, in this kind of a peer approach that that kind of very practical behavior is is uh, continues? Do you talk to everyone who writes I the first time and or, or do you expect <laughs> the teams to do that? You know, um, I, 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 I use sarcasm. <laughs> they know. So, for instance, uh, Ken, our founder, he is um, he's he's uh, uh, insane and, and and extremely brilliant and smart guy. Uh, when when he, he he does he writes a lot of stuff on um, on Slack uh, and, and and stuff like that. But he he um, the only the only time I saw him really really fucking pissed off and upset was hmm. somebody has done something and he just writes not cool. Then everybody knows. Okay, this is not okay. Um, but 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 people so so the in general setup so if you want to have something on the roadmap of a squad so we use slack um all squads have uh like a squad channel so that's what uh, voyager squad pioneer squad odyssey squad uh, our and you cannot write directly to any particular person you can always only write to a squad so if you write to a particular person in a squad they will say please write this in the squad channel mm. okay 
so 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 it's very so so if you of course we can write to each other and say hey uh, can we just connect do you have time this time whatever but whenever you have a question to somebody in a squad you always write to the squad channel hmm. Uh, because that's also we also use Slack of a way of tracking how how we're doing and making sure that we don't break our community communication. And you all know that people who've used Slack, it's it's horrible to to search for stuff in Slack, and you don't know was it the conversation I had with Anas and Manus, or was it the conversation with Manus, or was it in this group, or was it in that group. Mm -hmm. So we actually uh, make sure that all communication to squads happen within uh, that uh, that group, which is the squad group. And in that way, you always start a, a, a message with. Hi, Aura, or Hi, Voyager, or Hi, Surveyor, Hi, Pioneer. You don't write Hi, uh, Thomas, or Peter, or, or Søren. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's very much part of our culture, and so it's it's all these small nudging things that <laughs> a hundred small nudging things that that makes this culture right. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's stuff we think about all the time. Our squad logos. Uh, the border of the squad logos indicate where where the squad is sitting, but all the squad logos are, are kind of uh, look the same and it's designed by the same designer. Uh, but just the border of the squad logo shows what domain and what colony and what the uh, hub they're sitting in. So we try to use all these um, ambient uh, signals in, in in building the culture. Awesome, exciting, super 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 interesting. Thank you so much, Anas. It was uh, really thought provoking, and I, I really, I uh, just doing it. I mean, that's a giant leap of faith. Uh, kudos and hats off uh, for for making that happen. I think that's it takes a lot of courage. It's to to the moon. <laughs> yeah, exactly.